Amen. All right. Can we cue up Rabbi Zevs? Okay. He's just, I, I don't know, it's just a minute or two, but he, he wanted, you know, they're here every Sunday. They're here, they're here right now. You don't know it. Can you see them? Can, <laughs> they're right here. And they worship with us. And they, you know, our lives, my life and his life, and, and then the life of this church family and the life of his ministry, we're so entwined now and have been for many, many years. And the Lord is blessing us all because of it. And he then serves as a link for us to directly into the heart of the nation of Israel, which, as you know, all of prophecy, especially end time prophecy, circles around, centers around the return of the nation of Israel. I've preached on it before. I'll be preaching on it again very soon because it just cannot be set aside. I mean, that has to be continually a reminder to today's church. But they're there, born and raised there, Zeph was, and trained to be a rabbi, went through the, the, the rabbinical training school of the Sanhedrin to be a Sanhedrin rabbi. Everybody in his family, his dad, his granddad, his great-granddad, all of them rabbis, renowned rabbis. Some of them were rabbis in Israel before 1948, before it ever became or came back as the, a nation. Several of them were members of the Dayan, the rabbinical courts of Israel, which ties not constitutionally but very directly and very powerfully into the government itself. That's what Zev grew up in. But in the midst of that, he came out of Orthodox Judaism and the denial of Yeshua, the Hebrew word for Jesus, as Lord, he came out of that and came to Yeshua as Lord and Savior and was born again. And the Lord has used him to reach people all over the world. But his biggest heart, like, the, like a modern-day Apostle Paul, he'll, he'll preach to any and everybody and does all the time. But his biggest heart is for the people of God, the people of Israel, the Jewish people who are so close, so close to coming to Jesus Christ as Lord. And uh, God has anointed his ministry, and we're blessed to have him as a brother and a friend and a part of the ministry of Fit Graham at Baptist Church. Amen. You know that the Lord put us together as Ab and I, and we wrote a book together a couple of years ago. It's called The Rabbi, The Secret Message, and the Identity of Messiah. That book is still raging around the world. The Lord is using it. He uses it in his ministry all the time, witnessing to Orthodox Jews in Israel. So... Anyway, I'm going to play this clip. He recorded it last night, so it's good and fresh, and it is for you. Go ahead and play it, brother. Shalom. I'm Zef Bard. I'm speaking to you right here from Tel Aviv, Israel, and we are honored and blessed to be a part of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church, a part of the family, and work the harvest together in these end times. As we see, Hickory Hammock has never closed the doors of the congregation of the church during this difficult time. We encourage you to keep on worshiping the Lord every time that the doors are open and never take it for granted. As we look at our brothers and sisters in China that are being persecuted and even killed for the gospel of Yeshua, it reminds us of Hebrews 13, 3, where it says we are to pray for those that are persecuted and those that are in prison. And the reason God wants us to pray for those that are in prison and are persecuted is to remind us also not to take it for granted when we have an opportunity to serve the Lord. So I want to encourage you to keep on coming to the congregation, keep on coming to church, as long as those doors are open. Praise Yeshua. And may the Lord continue to bless you. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom, and may Yeshua bless you. Amen. Y'all give the Lord a hand of praise. And you're also telling Zev that you appreciate that because he is watching right now. He has a special heart for China as well, and so should we. It is the number one place of persecution. It used to be North Korea. Now China has taken the number one spot, according to all the people that keep track of this. Those two nations are very close together in the direct persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. His wife was born and raised in China. Lynn, many of you know that. She still has family there, and they've got deep connections to the underground church in China. And, um, 
And because of that, we have deep connections, although none of us have been there, but they know our name. They know our ministry. They know our connection to Zev and to Lynn, and they love us for that. The, 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 the book that Zev and I wrote together has ripped through those churches, and they're using it and studying it and teaching it and preaching the, you know, from it or from the Word of God, but connecting it to the Word of God and using it as a preaching and teaching tool. So they know who you are, and they know who we are, and that's why Zev, I'm sure, I'm just speaking for him. He didn't tell me this, but I'm sure that's why that was on his heart, because he knows that we have a special place in our heart as well, especially for our persecuted brothers and sisters in China. All right. Well, listen, please, if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You just heard Natalie quote from and then play a song that tied right in to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just speaking about don't lose heart, don't get immersed in a spirit of fear when the world is going out of its mind. By the way, ever since the Garden of Eden, it's always been out of its mind. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and it ebbs and flows like a roller coaster up and down. And among, in, in the midst of that, in the midst of the, the grip that the kingdom of darkness has on it until Jesus comes and releases that grip. And that's the promise of His Word. Those are the closing promises of God's Word. He's kept every other promise before those, so I'm pretty sure He's going to keep those promises too. That's why we come and sing and praise and worship, and that's what we look forward to. And the Bible says, comfort each other with these words, encourage each other with these words, long for His appearing, look for His appearing, pray for the speed of its coming. The only thing that, that, that makes me sometimes say, Lord, hold it back just a little longer, is the fact that you know and I know people that are lost, people that we love, people that we care about, people that we know that once the door to the ark is closed and the flood comes, that's it. But overall, I get up almost every day and say, even so, come Lord Jesus. I don't know the day or the time. I think I understand the eschatological scheme of how it's going to work out. But, you know, I leave room to be wrong about that. That's not my say. That's God's say. Amen? So what we can do, we can study the Scriptures, we can teach them, we can preach them, we can be passionate about where we stand, we can share them together, we can discuss them together. But the bottom line is the Lord has promised He is coming. He is coming back just like He came the first time, which is why I've said for so long we're now living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, for hundreds of years, even a thousand years or more, there were prophecies foretelling, foretelling, foretelling that all of that would come, that he would come where he would be born, be born as, from a virgin, that for, as a child, and from there he would, he would minister to the world, and from there he would, he would work miracles that the world had never seen, and from there he would deliver himself to a cross, and from there he would rise again. All of those prophecies were foretold as many as a thousand years or more. Some of them began literally in the Garden of Eden. I've preached on that before and showed that to you. And every one of them fulfilled to the detail. That's why my faith is in this word. There's no other word like it anywhere in the world, folks. Nothing like it anywhere. You cannot pull any religious book or any book that claims to be a book about prophecy or prophecies or God or the gods or, or the power within you or karma or anything you want to look at that has any spirituality or religiosity to it. There's nothing, nothing, nowhere like the Word of God that proclaims in a certain day, this will happen, and that will happen, and that will happen, and I will bring my, 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 my Messiah, my Christ, my anointed one, and he will do this, and he will do that, and he will do that, and then you will know that I am the Lord. And then after those days, I will bring back my people Israel. I will bring back a geographical Israel. I will bring them back from the nations from where they're scattered. And when you see that, then you will know that I am the Lord. Then you will know the clock has started. Then you will know. Well, we've already lived through two of the biggest prophetic fulfillments of the Old Testament. And we're right in the middle of the third. And I know among believers, especially in America, because we've, we've had it so good for so long, and we still do right here today. Think how good we have it right now as believers. <clears throat> oh, it could be better, and it has been better. Some of the reason that we've lost what we had is, is most of it's our fault. But we still have it wonderfully well. 
our brothers and sisters in China would give anything to just choose to go to church or not, get up, get in their car, drive through town, dress like you're going to church, letting everybody know you're going to church, park your car out in front of a building and a place where everybody knows that's what you're doing, come in, sing, praise, amen, worship, leave fellowship together, leave publicly out here, go to lunch somewhere and share Jesus with somebody if you want to and if they want to listen to it. And you don't go to prison for it. And your assets aren't seized, and your business isn't shut down, and your family's not whisked away in the middle of the night. We still have it good. Oh, we can, we can see. We're not stupid either. We can see how quickly we're losing. Losing a lot of those things and slipping right through the tips of our fingers. They're right at the tips of our fingers right now. Just a couple of more executive orders, and we could lose it. And we understand that. And because of that, because this is really the first time in the history of our nation where the church, protected by the sacrosanct First Amendment of a constitution that the whole world has studied for over 240 years, that and the Declaration of Independence, studied as a, a marvel of humanity. No other nation before us has ever had anything like this. Men that signed their name and said, we will give our lives to have a nation like this. And most of them did so that we could have a nation like this, so that we could do what we're doing right now. The world studies it. They marvel at it. And we, the church, have almost given it away. I said, yeah, the church. Well, you can't blame it all on us. Well, I'm not blaming it all on us. A lot of it's just from a fallen world. But we live in a fallen world. But Jesus himself is the one that told us, but look, you are the church. You're the light. You're the salt. If you don't shine your light, darkness will overwhelm you. If you don't be the salt, if you lose your saltiness, the world will trample that salt underfoot. Guess what? Darkness is moving in. The church is being trampled underfoot. So whose fault is that? See what I'm saying? It's a bitter pill to swallow. Nobody likes to eat crow. But the longer you wait to eat it, the nastier it tastes. Judgment begins with the house of the Lord. So, I can't be the pastor of all churches, and there are pastors that are doing the same things that I and we and you are doing, and more and even better. I'm not claiming we're the only ones. I don't have an Elijah complex, you know. He battled the prophets of Baal, then went and hid in a cave and called out to God and said, Lord, I'm the only one. And, and God said, and I'm going to put it in Milton language, shut up, boy. I've got 7,000 others like you scattered all over the nation. Get out of your little pity party, get up, stand up like a man, and go out and be an ambassador for my kingdom. Amen? So, so I don't have that complex, but I just, I'm grieved because I know that churches like this overall, I mean, we've still got growing to do and tweaking to do, and we're certainly not perfect, but churches like this and better, they're getting fewer and fewer and farther and farther in between. More and more are now unwilling to speak to the major issues of the day that are biblical issues, but the, but the governments of the world have co-opted those biblical issues and turned them into political issues and societal issues. And then they tell the pastors all over the world, shut up. You shut your mouth about these things. You shouldn't be preaching politics. You just stay behind your four walls and do your little religious mumbo-jumbo. We'll take care of the rest of this. And most of the churches, most, according to their own admission, and I've, I've got all this reference and I've preached on it before. I'm not going to bore you with all the facts and st statistics. But most of the churches in the world have obliged the governments and they have shut up. That's called letting the salt get trampled on. That's called not shining the light in the darkness. Amen? So you don't have to answer out loud, but I'll ask again. So whose fault is it? Yeah. So I can't be the pastor of all the churches, and you can't be a member of all the churches. And, but we can certainly make sure, to the best of our ability, with the Holy Spirit's help, that we do all that we can to make sure that you are real, I am real, this church is real, and that we're reaching out to the world 
with as much love and as much reality of this word as we can. Amen? Yeah, okay. And that's my heart. In the meantime, because we are using technology, if other pastors, other churches are emboldened by it and strengthened by it and encouraged by it, then that's a wonderful thing. And some have been, and we are actually hearing from some. Some have reopened their doors after listening to us preach and teach and worship and me being on the Internet and on TV and radio, begging pastors, please, please, make some tough decisions, take some stands. Do not give up meeting together. Please, the Word of God says it, commands us even more so as you see the days approaching, Hebrews 10 says. In other words, what that means is even if it gets really tough, even if it gets really, see, it's like our brothers and sisters in China. They, they, they were told, you cannot worship like this. You cannot. And so they disappeared into the underground church. And now millions of them meet. And they may not meet on Sundays because that's a day there are governments out looking for them. They might meet on a Tuesday night. might be a Thursday morning. It doesn't matter doesn't matter because if you're in Jesus Christ, you're keeping the Sabbath, right? See, America is one of the only places where we sit around and castigate each other because we're not worshiping on a certain day. Isn't that crazy? When the New Testament says Jesus has fulfilled it all. He is the Sabbath. Hebrews, the whole book of Hebrews says if you are in Jesus Christ, you are keeping the Sabbath. He is your Sabbath rest. The Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Amen? Jesus said that, not Carl Gallup's. Man, it's been so easy to be a Christian in America for so long and the stupid stuff that we've argued about as a church. So, here we are now. Now, I mentioned some of these things. I think it was last Sunday morning or the Sunday before, but I'm going to re-mention them, but in a little, little different framework, so bear with me. I haven't lost my mind. So, he just said that. No, I know I did. But I want you to hear this because it goes with where we're going this morning from a, from a, from a different angle of context of, of how, how we are to live in these days. But there are five, five borders, folks, biblical borders. I'm sure there are more, but these are the, what I call the big five. You just don't mess with without invoking the discipline. I, I'm, no, let's, let's not soften the word. Without invoking the judgment of God. Five borders. In my latest book, The Summoning, I do several chapters on it. I've got them listed. So if you say, man, I, I don't have anything to take notes with, let's just get that. It's all there. And plus, it's all referenced to prove that everything I'm going to say is accurate and true. But the five borders of these, you don't mess with the borders of the returned Israel. Can I get an amen? Y'all don't leave me up here naked, please. I mean, the word of God is clear. He brings that back as a, and he, and he basically puts a curse on any nation that will try to manipulate what God is doing with that sign. That is his last day sign that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is very near. And I deal with all of that in the book, and I, I make sure that, uh, that I'm accurate about that so you can get that. But the, but the point is, and I'm not here to tell you to get a book. I'm just saying that if you're wanting more information or you're wanting, well, back that up. It, I have, okay? It's in a 300-page book. You can get it. <laughs> but the point I'm making is you don't mess with the borders of Israel. Now, one of the things that I did in there is I showed, and this is before the election. I made no prophecies, no predictions about the election. I wrote the book before the election occurred. But I compared the administration of Barack Obama to the administration of Donald Trump. And I was very careful and very clear to say that I did not think, and I wasn't making the case that somehow Barack Obama was the devil incarnate or that somehow Donald Trump was some angel from heaven. I just said, God uses kings, or in this case presidents, that term wasn't in the Bible in the day, rulers and leaders, he uses them to move his prophetic word from point A to point Z. He does. And I know people say, but hasn't God used the United States? Yes, he has, and he's blessed us. But just because God uses a nation doesn't mean that that in and of itself is a blessing. He used the Roman Empire to bring forth his son. He also used the Roman Empire to put him on a cross. 
He also used the Roman Empire for the church to be birthed and then for persecution to come against the church so that the church would know down through the ages how to deal with persecution and have an example of it and teaching about it. He used all of that. Does that mean that the Roman Empire was some kind of angelic presence that came down from the throne of God? No, it means that God is sovereign. And he uses Pharaoh, he uses Persian emperors, Greek emperors, Babylonian emperors, King Nebuchadnezzar. He can use anybody he wants. So in my book, that's, that's what I say. I, I'm just saying. But if you look at this comparison, it's striking. And now that we have come on the other side of the election, and of course you know I wished it had turned out a different way, but I didn't even hint to that in the book. That wasn't any of my business at that point. My point was what I'm getting ready to make now. Under the regime of Barack Obama, all five of the big five borders were violated ferociously. And a darkness swept this land and swept this planet. You do not mess with the borders of Israel. You do not mess with national borders in a way that violates conscious and, and, and uh, common sense and the sanctity and safety of its people. National borders were created by God. In fact, he created them at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis, it speaks about how God is the one that sets the people apart. He set them into nations. He divided them up. He set their boundaries. And then you continue to move through the Scriptures, and what you discover is, is that when God brought judgment upon His own people, the nation of Israel, because they were going up into the mountains and building altars to the pagan gods, even around Jerusalem, even King Solomon did it. He went up to the Mount of Olives on a place now that's called, oh, it's in Hebrew, but in English it would be like the, the, the Hill of Shame. It's still known that way to this day. There are different words for it. In Hebrew, I can't pronounce it. Zev could if he's here. He's screaming at the TV right now. And he's probably put the word you idiot behind it. But anyway. But watch. The, the, this, this hill of shame. Why? Because these altars looked down on the city of Jerusalem. So all of the people could always see them. They were ever before their face. Like billboards. Like movies. Like television screens like internet, like cell phones, always before their face, the filth. Solomon did that. Why? To appease his concubines. It was wrapped around sexual immorality. You know what God did? He said, I will now allow your borders to be encroached by your enemies. Your borders will become like sieves, and your enemies will come among you. You don't mess with national borders. You don't mess with the borders of Israel. The Obama administration brought all of that in. Oh, it had always been played with, but I mean, I mean, it was on steroids. You don't mess with the borders of gender. God created little girls and little boys. Now, now we live in a fallen world, so there are some legitimate medical conditions where there's gender confusion and even physiological confusion, very, very minuscule, but th they're people, and that's hurting to them and the families. And so bless the Lord that he's given us knowledge, and we've developed some medical procedures and even some drug therapy to help, to, to help these little ones kind of get in touch with themselves and to lead a good, normal life. The problem is, under the Obama administration, they said, you know, we can take all that technology and just use it any old perverted way we want, and here it came. You don't mess with that. Jesus said it about as clearly as you could say it. He says, and woe be unto anyone that messes with these little ones like this. It would be better that they had a millstone wrapped around their neck and thrown into the depths of the ocean. I, I think he meant that if you mess with that, you're under his judgment, and you will answer for it. What do you think? You don't mess with those borders. I'm going to tell you something else you don't mess with. You do not mess with the border of marriage. That's the other institution, the first institution that God ordained in the Garden of Eden. 
You don't mess with that. What God has created, let not man separate. And, and that's one of the English translations. It can be put asunder, the old King James, which really is a better because that means you don't pull it apart. You don't tear it apart. You don't redefine it. What God has joined together. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Have you not heard? Have you not known from the beginning? Jesus repeated it in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. He says, and then what God has created, what he designed in the garden, what he has ordained as a marriage, you best not mess with it. Are you following me? You don't mess with marriage, home, family, genders, national borders, Israel's borders. You just, you just don't mess with that. And the Obama administration was kind of the exclamation point at the end of a sentence because the sentence had been building for a long time. So that's why I say I'm not putting it all on him. I'm just saying it's, it's historically true. It's all documented. The fifth one, you don't mess with the borders of the womb. You don't. Again, again, and people debate this, but again, it's like a child that's born with physiological problems. There are some situations where it's really, really tough and difficult. People have to make decisions about death and dying, who's going to die, the baby or the mama, and all of that stuff. I get that. But 98.9% of all abortions are done for convenience. Those are the ones I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about them all, but I'm saying for the sake of this message, those are the ones I'm concerned about. I don't want to argue with people about the other less than 1%. I'm telling you, you don't mess with that. And not the same year you pass a law that you can mess with it, you pass a federal law saying you can't mess with a turtle egg or an eagle egg or we'll put you in prison. See, when you, I mean, you just spit in God's face. It was bad enough to pass Roe v. Wade. But the same law for the same federal government to turn around and say, however, while you're pulling out children and throwing them in trash cans for sake of convenience, it'll be okay. But while you're doing that, if you step on a turtle egg at the beach purposely, or if you mess with an eagle's nest, served and worshipped created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And he says, and because of that and other things, he gave them over to a depraved mind. Do you see a world full of mental depravity right now? Do you sense and smell and feel a demonic outpouring right now? So I compared that to the Trump administration. And, and, and listen, it's not about Obama and Trump. It's not. Hang in here with me. And I say that in the book, but it's just the facts of the facts. The, the administrations were the administrations. So eight years, we watched all of that happen. All five borders spit upon and violated continually. When Trump came into office... At least his platform was wrapped around reversing somehow or doing something of all five of those. National borders, Israel. We watched him do a lot for Israel. We watched him do a lot, tried to do a lot for the national borders. Of course, the whole time is dealing with the Mueller report and impeachment and COVID and, and BLM and Antifa and riots and burning and pillaging for, the, for all four years. But he did his best to protect the national borders, not making him perfect, not making him an angel from heaven. I'm just speaking truth to you. He did his best to protect the borders of Israel, even to enhance that with Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Did his best to protect the borders of the womb, stood against abortion and federal funding of it, et cetera, et cetera. Did his best, ex rescinded the executive orders of the previous administration about little boys and girls showering together and doing sports together and changing clothes together in school. That filth, just degenerate filth and non-science, science-denying executive orders, he reversed those. I mean, I, I, all five, he did his best, in my humble opinion, and or tried to and met brick walls to begin to reverse those. So I write in the book about during that time, you could, you could see with your eyes the spiritual warfare. The five borders that the Bible says don't mess with these, the previous administration for eight years had messed with them, twisted them, and perverted them. And then Trump came in and said he would and made a good, good effort to reverse those. And then after four years, 
the Obama administration comes back in. And all five borders are being trashed again. And in the first two or three days, executive orders were issued to trash most of them. Our own national borders, stopping the building of the walls. And, and I, wanna, I don't want to turn this into a big, big, big thing on the political movements and agendas today. I'm just, I'm just, I'm getting you to think from a biblical standpoint because what we're watching, it, Paul wrote about in Ephesians 6, our battle's not against flesh and blood. Yes, it is. Yes, that's where you see it. Yes, it's in the halls of government. Yes, it's in elections. Yes, it's whatever king or president is. Yes, but that's not where the battle is. It's spiritual, and you gotta, you've got to train your spirit to see it. You got to be in the Word. You got to know that way you're not in the dark. That way, none of this takes you by surprise. I'm, I'm quoting scripture here. That way, we know what's happening and we know how to respond. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and the unseen realms, powers of wickedness and darkness. That's one of the most succinct ways that that truth is put in the scriptures, but in the Old Testament, that truth is before us, in the New Testament, and in other places besides Ephesians 6. It's not like there's just one verse that speaks of this all the way through. And the Bible talks about after the return of Israel, after the gospel is exploding before the world, after Israel returns, and during that time, that there will be a demonic outpouring. And all of that was said before we even had the technology that we have now for the whole world to speak to itself 24-7 instantaneously. Yet the scriptures that are thousands of years old spoke of the whole world seeing things at once, taking a mark at once, bowing down and worshiping one person at once, on and on. All that technology is there. Book of Daniel says, and in those days, uh, people will run to and fro over the face of the earth, and, and, and knowledge will increase, and that word in Hebrew means exponentially increase. And just in the last 20 to 30 years, we've had an exponential explosion of technological knowledge, not wisdom, but knowledge. Knowledge will get you in trouble if it's not tempered with wisdom and biblical truth, Right? All of it was spoken of thousands of years ago. That's not in the Quran. It's not in the teachings of the Hindu Vedas. It's not in the writings of Buddha. It's not in the teachings of Nostradam. One place in all the world where all of this stuff was written long before it happened, and we are in the midst of it right now. So I'm saying the five borders. And now, so it ebbs and flows. You see, eight years, Obama. Not that he's the evil one, but I'm just saying that's where it all kind of just really coupled with the technology that boosted it to the whole world. I mean, we literally, under the Obama administration, were telling other nations, if you don't do gay marriage and if you don't do abortion, we're going to cut off your money that feeds your people. Literally, we told people we will starve you to death unless you go with this godless agenda. Because there were nations out there, some of the African nations that are really based upon Christianity. There's several of them that are, but they depend upon the United States of America to feed them. And they were told, you don't follow our agenda, you don't eat. Guys, you don't do that and escape God's judgment. And right behind it came Trump trying to turn some things back. And we saw the demonic outpour. Most of Americans, by the latest polls, believe that the whole thing, the whole election was a sham. And I know it's politically incorrect to even mention that. You should say that about this. Well, the left spent four years saying that the Trump election was a sham, that Russia did it. See, we can't say what we see with our eyes. Of course we can do you see the demonic involved? Do you see the manipulation, the lying, the deception, truth being thrown to the ground, lawlessness prevailing? Do you see it? And so, hashtag not the President Biden goes in office, and within days, he signs executive orders, national borders. He's already breathing threats against Israel and what they're going to do. 
He's already gone right to the womb of the woman and loosened up and we're going to make you pay and we're going to make this organization pay. We might even make churches pay for it. We, you know, I mean, that's coming. One of the first things he signed was little boys and little girls showering and dressing together. What is this fascination with little children? It is satanic. It is demonic. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden in the womb of the woman and the seed from the womb that's coming to destroy Satan's kingdom and abortion being the number one cause of death on the planet for several decades. It's all tied to the little ones. I told you guys 10 years ago from this pulpit, they're coming for your children. I've said it over and over and over. Why? Because I'm a prophet? Because I'm so smart? Nope, because I know the Word of God and I know where Satan's target is focused. They're coming for your children. First day in office. Couldn't wait to sign it. And now here we are. I told you before, I say I said this last week. I know it made a few people mad, and maybe some left, so let me make a few more people mad and make some more people leave. And pretty soon we're gonna get this church down to a church. What I said was, what I said was, and hopefully this doesn't apply to anybody here. And I mean that. I, I, I do. I'm not being a jerk. I'm just trying to be funny. And sometimes I sound like I'm a jerk. But, but, but there's truth in it. What I said was, now that it's the order of the day, what if I, as the pastor said, from now on, every youth trip we take, every mission trip we take, every back-to-school retreat trip we take, we're going to tell our kids. And when I went, oh, you parents don't even need to stay out of it. It's their deal. It's my business and their business. And children can, can shower together. They can change together. If a little boy says, you know, I feel more like a girl today. Go ahead, son. Get in the girl shower. And your little girl comes home and tells you. Oh, okay. And here's where I made people mad. Because you know, I didn't make people mad by saying that because you know that that is an illustration I would never do. I would cut my own throat before I would even begin to do anything like that. But the point I made was, if I did do that, there would be people, hopefully, in here, that would address me, try to get rid of me, and if for some reason I couldn't or wouldn't leave, and that would just be a coup, but let's just say I didn't, then you would leave. But here's where I made people mad. And I said, and then some of you, the very next Monday, Monday morning, would take your children and drop them off at school. You, you hear what I'm saying? That's how the church loses its saltiness. Get mad at the preacher or leave his church, put lawsuits against him, threaten to kill him, but then the next day take those same children and put them in a school that by executive order is going to do it. This is where we are, guys. It's happening in Santa Rosa County, and it's going to happen in Santa Rosa County, and don't you ever think it won't. I told you about the woman that's a school administrator in Santa Rosa County that came to our Facebook page the first day he signed that order, and I put it on the Facebook page just so people would know. That's all, just so they would know. And she came over there blessing us out for putting it up there. What are y'all afraid of? Block, delete, remember? Block, delete. She had several of her followers came over and did the same thing. Block, delete. That's our Facebook page. We're going to stand in the Word. We're going to protect our children. You don't want to protect your children? That's fine. I went to her first. I went to her Facebook page. She had pictures of her children on her Facebook page. Boy, I wanted to say something, but I didn't. I wasn't going to come down to that level. So here's the point, guys. This is where we are. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you heard Natalie read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a portion of it. And I'm just paraphrasing. Basically, don't fear. Don't get all fretful. You know, don't fold. Don't cave. Don't lose heart. Stay courageous. Stay, do what's right. Stay, keep speaking what we're speaking here and amening and clapping to. And then, but don't just, but, but here's the thing. Here's why I use that illustration. If I did it here, you'd all get mad. But then the next day, you'd go take your kids and put them in school. Don't, don't get mad at that illustration. That's a, that's a point I'm making to show that, that you, can't, you can't waver. You can't be double-minded about this. If it's right for me and for Hicker Hammock and for your children here, then it's right for the school system. And if the school system won't do it or can't do it, then make other plans. And again, this is not a cult. I'm not going to tell you how to run your families or how to educate your children, but you got to be smarter than the system, folks. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 
Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. You heard Natalie's scripture. They were having tough times. The church at Corinth was in the city of Corinth, a major city in a major region. The Roman Empire was divided into states, if you will, provinces. Judea was a province where Jerusalem was. Galilee was a province, etc. Corinth is in another province. It's a seaport city. It's huge. A lot of filth, a lot of paganism, a lot of sexual perversion. Paul talks about that. Perversion, sexual perversion in the church that people in the church were actually celebrating. That's another whole sermon. We'll get to it. Not everybody in the church was, but some were. You know, this guy was living in filth openly before him, and some of the people were running around, maybe some of the other guys that were either baby Christians or not Christians, running up, slapping him on the back, saying, you go, boy, you go, egging it along. Boy, you a man, look what you're doing. Paul says, uh, if he won't repent, put him out of the church. Paul said that. That's another whole sermon. I told you this notes now. I'm tempted to go preach that. Anyway, anyway. The place was so filthy. Corinth was so filthy. And the persecution against Christians was great. That's why Paul wrote two letters that we have. And was giving them instruction from the Lord and from the Word. And how to live in that. It was so filthy that a byword was developed in the Roman Empire in that day. It's like... We have sodomy laws on the books of, you know, or we used to, probably don't anymore, but you've heard of the, where, where did that come from? From Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what'd you do? You took the name of the city that was so filthy and you turned it into a legal term. Don't do this. This is horrible. And you use the name of the city. Do you get that? A byword. It became a byword. In the Roman Empire, it was called to Corinthianize. That's in, that's in historical records from way back. They would talk about, yeah, they're out Corinthianizing tonight. Immersed in sexual filth and debauchery and degrading activities. They're Corinthianizing. That's who Paul's writing the letter to. Look what he says. He says, since then, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. That means to reverence Him, to know Him. And, and, and so since because of that, we try to persuade men. That means men, women, boys, girls. You know that. And what we are is plain to God. And I hope it's also plain to your conscience. Y'all look at me for just a moment. That's why I read Psalm 139 of you a little while ago. Lord, you know my thoughts from afar. You know what we are is plain to God. Before I speak a word on my lips, you already know what it is. Who we are is plain to God. Are we can fool people. We can fool people all day long, but you ain't going to fool God. He, he knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows the DNA of every living thing on the planet. How do you know that? The Bible doesn't say that. Yes, it does. In the days of Noah, he knew the only righteous people left, but you know what else he did? He said, Noah, don't worry about it. You're going to build a ship that will hold a bunch of animals? And you don't even have to go get them. I'm going to bring them to you. I know which ones whose flesh is not corrupted because the Bible says all flesh was becoming corrupt and God was getting ready to set the reset. But God knows the DNA of everything. He programmed it. He created it. Are you all with me? So what Paul is saying is, he says, you do know. He says, we fear God, we reverence Him, we worship Him, and we want to please Him. First of all, because He's been so good to us, He saved us through Jesus Christ. And secondly, because because He's the one that knows who we are. He knows what we think. He knows what we were getting ready to say and held it back, but He already knew that word. And then He says, and I hope your consciences know it as well. Here's here's my biggest concern for the church in America right now, and this is one of the reasons I brought this. Because people, I'm going to beg you and plead with you. And I'm not talking down to you. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to me too. It's going to be very easy and very tempting to let your consciences be seared in the midst of the flood of filth that is coming. And what do I mean by that? I mean to acquiesce to it, to adjust to it, to give in to it, to justify it. That's why in 2015, five, almost six years ago, when the Supreme Court 
on the ninth of Tammuz, and I've already told you what that was, a day of judgment in the Hebrew calendar, and on that day, the Supreme Court said, we don't know what a marriage is anymore, just be with whoever you love. That's going to morph into something really nasty soon, if the Lord doesn't come. It's already nasty, but it's going to morph into something really nasty. But for the last five or six years, other than this church and a few others, where have you heard it preached and preached and preached and preached? It's a sin. It's an aberration. It's God's judgment. This is one of the reasons we're under God's judgment. You cannot mess with the borders of, the, of, of a marriage. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. How often do you hear that preached in pulpits? Very, very little, if at all. We do it continually here. And we continually lose people over it. You know why? Their consciences get seared. They determined that they were going to just live with it and adjust to it and justify it. Well, you know, it's the law of the land. And the Bible says we got to obey the law, Brother Carl. And then they pervert that scripture. And then it's like, well, I've got friends and family. Well, so do I. And I love them. And I'm smart enough. I'm not an evil dude looking to trash people and cuss people out. I know how to love people who are caught up in sin and at the same time to say, I'm not going to support that sin. I will love you. I will, you, you get hungry, you get hurt, you, get, you call me. I'll be there. I'll do what I can to minister to you without any judgment upon you. But if you ask me or get in my face about, well, what do you have against this? I, I just, I'm just, I stand in the Word of God and I know what God's Word says. It, it's that simple. I'm smart enough to do that. You know, the old adage, you know, I can hate the sin and love the sinner. People say, oh, that's so trite, you can't do it. No, yeah, I, I can do that. Can you? Yeah, we're smart enough and godly enough. And so I'm saying, as Paul is saying to the church here, just fear God. And that word fear doesn't mean necessarily, I'm scared to death. Even. It just means respect Him, honor Him, reverence Him, stand in His Word. He knows your every thought. Don't play with what's happening in the world. Don't pick up the snakes of the world and think they won't bite you. They will. And if you ever get to where your conscience doesn't see anything wrong with what God's Word says is wrong, you need to really do a heart check. It could be you're not even saved. Now, that's not for me to say. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just saying Jesus said not everybody on that day who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So if you say, I belong to Jesus, but you know what? I think anybody should just marry whoever they want. It's the law of the land. It's a bat, 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 bat. You spit in God's face, spit on his word, and God says, just because you come to church and say, Lord, Lord, when you're not doing my, you're, you're trashing the institution that I ordained and said humanity had better not mess with this. And you're going to say, but I'm saved. Well, check that out with the Lord, guys. I would say probably not. But, but that's just me. And even if you would say, but I know I am, then then grow up. And what I mean by that, mature, the Bible says we got to become mature in the Word so that even the hard things we do because God says do them, right? That's what I mean when I say then grow up. Grow up in the Lord. If you know you belong to the Lord and you have let your conscience be seared by the political correctness of the day. Well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and let my kids go down there. I know they probably won't let my kids shower with somebody. They probably say, be careful, guys. That snake will bite you. That's all I'm saying. Again, this is not a cult. I don't look in your windows. And I don't tell you how to raise your family. Opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. <laughs> wow. If we are out of our mind, that is because people were saying they were. He said, well, then it's for the sake of God. See, I don't mind being called crazy if I say a marriage is between a man and a woman. I don't mind. What, what are you afraid of? Little boys and little girls, what are you afraid of? You're out of your mind. Yeah, well, I guess I am. I'm out of my mind for the Word of God and for truth. And by the way, for real science. And he says, so if we're out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. And if we're in our right mind, it is for you. In other words, we don't have a depraved mind, and so we're going to use that to bless you. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that, that he died for all, once for all. Therefore, all have died who are in him. And he died for all that those who live no longer live for themselves, 
but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now we live for the word. Now we live for him. Now we want to walk in the truth. Now we, From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once even regarded Jesus Christ that way. But we do so no longer. In other words, folks, that means we've got to think biblically. We've got to think spiritually about life and what's happening in the world and what's happening prophetically and what's happening in Israel and the United States and what's happening in the United Nations and with the one world order and what's happening with all these executive orders and why do they just happen to be sexual depravity and national borders and womb borders? Why do they all have to be that? Because it's spiritual. We can't regard everything from the humanly point of view anymore. We're living in very spiritual prophetic times. Can I get an amen? All right, that's what he's saying. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the old has come and the new has, the, excuse me, the old is gone or is continually leaving and the new has come and is continually coming. In other words, it's, you saw that 30 years ago and you said, you know, that guy's perfect. He's never made mistakes. He'd be our pastor and he's going to teach us how to be perfect. Oh, I'm being funny, of course, because that's not even close to the truth. We're all under the sanctification process. We're all kind of learning and growing and maturing if that's our desire and that's our heart and we're seeking after God, right? Amen? But then we are a new creation. The Holy Spirit of God is in us. The blood of Jesus is over us. Therefore, when God looks at Carl Gallup's, he doesn't see the filth and the sin that is a part of my sin nature, he sees the blood of his Son that covers me and the mark of the Holy Spirit seal, Ephesians 1.19. We're sealed with the mark of the Holy Spirit, and then he sees the righteousness of his Son so that we become the righteousness of his Son, and God declares us righteous. Just give the Lord a hand. Just like if you were before a judge in a court and you'd done some heinous crime and the whole thing was tried out and then the judge stepped forward and said, I declare you not guilty. And everybody in the court knows you were. How can you do that? And the judge says, because I'm the judge and I'm saying it. He might have done it, but I'm declaring him not guilty. You're free. <sighs> on a cosmic scale, on an eternal scale, that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. None of us are saved because we were not guilty. We wouldn't need a Savior if we were not guilty, ever guilty for anything. But the judge of the universe, because we came to him and threw ourselves at his mercy and said, I'm pleading the blood, put me under the blood, put me under your righteousness, save me, I repent of my sin, I want to now be a child for you. Jesus says, not guilty. You're free. Now you're a new creation. You have a new life. Now you can begin again, and I will give you the Holy Spirit of God to help you. Just don't compromise. Don't pick up all the snakes of the world and think you're not going to get bit. Don't say one thing and live another way. Get out there. Be my child. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. And remember who declares you not guilty. Amen, church? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Give a, all right, keep reading. Verse 18, we're almost done. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That God is reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's the gospel. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us we implore you then on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I just said all of that. So the whole point is, what do we do? How do we live in this? Every generation has had to ask that question. You can see the spiritual warfare, Obama years, this border, this border, this border, this border, this border, violated, spit upon. The Trump years, he tries to fix all five borders, and he does some and some he doesn't, but you can see the given, and they hate him. The world hates him. Witches, do you remember witches around the world were on the Internet doing incantations against him continually, especially in the high holy days of Halloween and Beltane? Isn't this strange, weird? I mean, it's so biblical. You can see it if you know what you're looking for. And the whole time, if you try to call it out, the world will say, yeah, you don't believe your lion eyes. Am I right? 
But the Word of God's been telling us for thousands of years how it's going to be. And so when it happens and you see it with your own eyes, and now hashtag not the President Biden goes in, brings back in the Obama administration, first executive orders. Boom, 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 boom. The five borders that you don't mess with are being messed with again. This is spiritual war. Which is what Revelation 12, 12 says. Satan, woe unto you earth. Satan has been thrown down to you. He is filled with rage because he knows his time is short. The rage is palpable, folks. A lot of it's coming right out of our own Congress. People that are Republicans and Democrats, they're all evil. <laughs> Individuals may not be, but I mean just as a whole, they're all evil. The whole thing is evil. The whole thing is corrupted. All over the earth. All over the earth. Israel's been back 72 years. The fig tree has bloomed. Now it's hanging with low-hanging ripe fruit getting ready to fall. We're in the summer months of the fig tree. And the spiritual war is raging around us. It is palpable. You can feel it. You can smell it. And God's word, that was the word for the people who were living in the middle of Corinthianizing. <laughs> so filthy, it's like saying we're in the middle of Sodom. Jesus said the last days would be just like the days of Lot. Just like the days of Noah. Well, folks, here we are. What do we do? Very simple. You fear the Lord. You stand in His word. He knows your heart like nobody else does. Do not try to fool him. Do not let your conscience be seared. Do not pick up the snakes of this world and massage them and try to justify them and say, well, you know, I just, you know, but Brother Carl, you don't understand. You know, you're a preacher. I got to live here. Well, where do you think I live? I, yeah, I mean, come on, folks. I got to buy groceries at the same grocery store you do. They hate you there. They hate me there. I mean, you know, we all live here together. Yeah, but it's easier for you. I would say to you, if you would sit in my shoes for a few months, you'll probably find it's a lot harder for me because I'm expected, if I ever, ever water it down, I get hammered and I'm not going to water it down because I don't want to. It's a whole lot easier for folks that aren't in the position I'm in to get out there and kind of just weave your way through the world and, well, yeah, well, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, yeah, Carl, yeah, yeah, our preacher's a little crazy sometimes, yeah, you're right, you know, and just keep going. I'm just telling you, we just, we just can't do that, folks. We, 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 we cannot, and this is what Paul told the church at Corinth, you got to stand in the Word. You can't just go around saying, Lord, 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 I did this in your name, did that in your name. Yeah, but you didn't stand in my Word. Therefore, I, I don't know you. That's what Jesus said, not Carl. This is what Paul's telling the church at Corinth. What Natalie was ministering to us. Don't fret, don't fear, don't get all anxiety ridden. Keep a song in your heart. Keep your praise before the Lord. Stand in the Word. Stand on the Word. You're smart enough to stand on the Word without being a jerk about it, right? We don't go around cussing people out, getting in people's faces, sticking our finger in people's faces like a bunch of Pharisees. We're smart enough not to do that. But on the other hand, we cannot back up when we're confronted with, well, what do you have against gay marriage? I have nothing against gays. People want to live that way. It's fine. I'm not looking in their windows. I don't want them looking in my window. But I have a problem with gay marriage because God has a problem with it. And it's not just gay marriage. It's all kinds of perversion that goes with it. People living together that aren't married. People that are out fornicating all the time before they're even married, before they even have a relationship with them. I mean, there's all kinds. It's not like that's the unforgivable sin. But it begins with what God did in the Garden of Eden. said, here's a man, here's a woman. This is how marriage should be. One man, one woman. I'm putting it together. Let not the world mess with it or else. So, that would apply to Carl Gallops. Don't let Carl Gallops mess with it or else, Carl Gallops. Put your name in there. Don't let, put your name in there. Mess with that or else. Put your name in there. That's what Paul's telling them. And he's saying, he wraps it up by saying this, and this is how I'm going to wrap it up. He said, it all boils down to this. If you're under the blood, you've been declared righteous. Therefore, you are now an ambassador for Jesus Christ and for the gospel. But it's so tough out there. That's why you're an ambassador. Of course it is. It's crazy. That's why you're an ambassador. 
It's dark. That's why you're an ambassador. It's nasty. That's why I put you as an ambassador. Because what does it say an ambassador is? As though God is making his appeal through you. That's what it says. Well, that's exactly what he's doing. That's what an ambassador is. When a king or a president sends an ambassador for, to a foreign country, that ambassador speaks as it, it's the king or the president until the king or the president says something different. Well, we don't have to worry about God changing his mind on the five big borders, do we? They're right there. Be an ambassador. Speak the truth. Don't compromise. Don't let your conscience be seared. Stand as a man of God. Stand as a woman of God. Be the church. Be real in our lives. We'll stumble and fall along the way, and then that's where we pick each other up, encourage each other, brush the dirt off, get some repentance going, get some prayer going, help each other out of the sin if people want to be helped out of it, and keep going. Amen? Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus, right? Because times are different. They're ebbing and flowing. Nothing ever remains the same. We will see what happens right around the corner. But you know what? We don't know what's right around the corner, do we? There are things coming, good and bad, that we cannot even envision right now. We all woke up one morning and 9-11 happened. We didn't, nobody saw that coming. <laughs> Not from the common folks, we didn't. You understand what I'm saying? We don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to be ambassadors for Jesus. We're going to stand in the Word. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to let our consciences be seared. We're not going to be making excuses why it's okay if we bend a little and bend a little and blow a little like a tree in the wind. We're going to build our house on the solid rock so that as the storm keeps raging, and it will, that our house is not going to collapse in the sinking sand. Amen? We're going to stand on the rock of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand. We're going to stand on the rock of Jesus. We're going to stand on the rock of Jesus, church. Amen. Pray with me.